That's the definition of the gay logic. Yes. yes. So now the point is there are infinite uh, gay shastra, so yes. it can be there. So the number of points on the gay logic is infinite. Yes. So it's an infinite dimensional space. So the configuration space is infinite dimensional, right? Because you are path integrating over all the fields, right? Similarly, the gauge orbit is also infinite dimensional. Is that uh, yeah? Right, but once you put it on a lattice. The finite cell lattice. Then, of course, everything becomes finite. Right? Like in every path integral, you have to define it by um, you know, do, doing the integration by uh, thinking of the path integral as in uh, integral over discrete variables. Right? You make the space time into lattice. You define the fields at each lattice point. Right? Similarly, you will define the gauge transformation parameter at each lattice point, right? and then everything becomes finite. Right? The gauge orbit is finite dimensional. The configuration space is also finite dimension. So that lattice, you have to decide the boundary? You can take it to a periodic lattice, for example. Then, then it will be a, everything is finite, right? Is that clear? And then, so the point is that you always take, I will have in mind that when you talk about path integral, you are really doing integration over this discrete uh, system, because that's where the integration is really defined. And at the end, you take the limit, right? Both where the lattice spacing goes to zero and the volume of space time goes to infinity. Intercept itself. Well, that what I described yesterday was like a closed gauge orbit, right? In a sense, you can say it's intersecting it itself. It could happen, it depends on the particular loop that you use. Right? Normally, for continuous loops, uh, smooth continuous loops, uh, uh, you expect a smooth gauge orbit. Right? But sometimes what may happen is that in some points in the field configuration space, Maybe invariant under part of the gauge group. Okay, in which case this dimension of the gauge orbit will change at some subspaces. Okay. I will consider the case when you take x y, right? Suppose x y are the variables and you take the rotation of the symmetry, which is cos theta x minus sin theta y and plus sin theta y minus sin theta x plus cos theta y. So in this case, the gauge orbits are circles around the origin. Then in the xy plane, if you take this to be x, this to be y, right, there are circles around the origin. Okay. But at the origin, it's just a point. Okay. Where origin gets mapped to itself under gauge orbit. Okay. So it can happen that on some particular subspaces, okay, the gauge orbit changes its dimension, where it has one dimension and there is zero dimension. But generically, the gauge orbit will be determined by the dimension of the gauge group. Pardon? Uh, the gauge group, uh, you have the same dimension first? Well, uh, you take the dimension of the gauge group and multiply by the number of lattice points. Oh. Right? Because you have a gauge transformation for every space time point. Right? The way you think of gauge transformation parameter is that you have u of x. Right? So for every space time point, you have u, right, which has a certain number of parameters. Right? For S U N, for example, is n square minus one. Right? But that has to be multiplied by the total number of lattice points that you use for defining your path integral. Right? Because for every x there is a u, and those are all independent. Is that clear? Yeah? No, I have not said anything about difference between abelian and non-abelian. So whatever I'm going to do will be the same for abelian and non-abelian. So, but you have told something about related that gauge coming into play in the gauge transformation. The gauge loop. No, in the gauge transformation, the complication g comes into play. But no, that okay. That that has again nothing to do with abelian or non-abelian, right? The way you have introduced the coupling concept. Through is through 1 over g squared times f mu nu, f mu nu, right, or uh, g mu nu, g mu nu, then you made this change of variable, okay. 
and that G become part of the gauge transformation parameter. Okay. So that part is identical for abelian and non-abelian, right? What is referent is a nonlinear point. Okay. So even for the abelian part, the same problem will appear, right? We have seen in Maxwell's theory, for example, we have this kinetic term which is not inverted. <coughs> So there is no difference between abelian and non-abelian as far as this, these issues are concerned. Is that okay? Yeah. Any other question? What is the gauge transformation? U, so U of x, the collection of all these U's, they corresponds to a particular gauge transformation, right? So you take this U as a function of x, right? So that means you are specifying a gauge, uh, a, 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 a element of the group a G, at every point x in space time, right? that whole collection of information is called a particular gauge transform. Right? So once you give that information, then you know how the field is transformed. See, if you give u at a particular point, right, then you don't know how v mu a transforms, right? Because if you remember the transformation of v mu okay? or s mu, this way, s mu prime. This involves minus i del mu u u inverse plus U S mu U inverse, right? Okay. So to calculate this part, you actually have to know you as a function of x, right? I mean, if you want to discretize, right, then this is U at a particular lattice point minus U at a neighboring lattice point divided by the lattice uh, spacing. That's the way you have to define what this object is. So that's why a gauge transformation remains the collection of all these things. Well, we'll take this to be an analytic function, but once you discretize, right, then of course you take it to be anything that you like. Right? Just like in field space, right, if when you discretize, right, then there is no meaning of it being continuous function. Right? Then you just have to hope that in the path integral, right? Fluctuations where it becomes highly fluctuating, those are somehow suppressed. Right? And the same we have to hope for the gauge transformation that the role of gauge symmetry, right, where u is fluctuating very rapidly, right, those should not matter too much. Right? But uh, so at the continuous continuous level, you can take it to be continuous function, but once you discretize, then there's a control. Right? You just have to take them to be independent and uh, to let them do whatever they want. Question. Okay, so let me then remind you the problem that you want to solve. Okay. So we have this gauge orbit. So what you want to do is somehow that we pick one point from each gauge orbit okay, and integrate along, along dot that direction and not include the gauge orbit in that. So this is done by drawing some subspace okay, which is transverse to the gauge orbit. Okay, it doesn't have to be orthogonal, we have not even introduced the notion of a metric, right? So, uh, but it has to be uh, transverse, it, it should move in the same direction as the gauge orbit. Okay? And now you integrate over this subspace, okay? So instead of integrating over the full space, which was giving you a problem, okay, we want to restrict the integral over this subspace. Is that clear? Okay, and then you have to hope that that integral should be well defined, even though the full integral had this problem because of this infinite factor. Okay, so let me give an example, okay? So let's take this symmetry, for example. Okay, which, is, which is what I have defined. Suppose this, so this is a finite dimensional example, okay, the simplest possible thing that you can imagine. Okay. So suppose you want to calculate this object, n over t, as integral dx dy, which will be minus lambda x plus y squared, x plus y squared, divided by integral dx Okay. 
Okay. So this is like our i times s, okay, sitting in the exponent. This is like our operator O, whose expectation we are trying to calculate. Okay. But these, of course, are path integral. This is an ordinary two-dimensional integral. Now, this of course can be calculated easily. Okay. The gauge orbits here are just circles, as I have drawn here. So one way to do this is to change variables. Okay, if you change variables to r and theta, it becomes integral r dr d theta into the minus lambda r square r square over integral r dr d theta to the minus lambda r square. And so now the idea is that the theta integral okay, can be factored out. This is in fact the gauge reaction. Okay? Theta integral is what is moving you along the gauge orbit. Okay? So theta integral can be factored out. Okay? And we get this as integral r dr e to the minus lambda r square r square divided by integral r dr. And I think this is about 1 over lambda. This is 1 over lambda. Okay, this we can check. Okay, these are elementary integrals that you can easily work on. Okay, but what we want to do is something different. And the reason that we want to do something different is because we want to eventually generalize it to the more complicated case. Okay. What I have done here really requires that we somehow fact, I mean, change variables. And factor out the integration of the gauge orbit. Okay, but changing variables when the uh, thing is uh, infinite dimensional is not very easy. Okay. So what we want to do is to see if this integral can be somehow evaluated by integrating another gauge orbit. Okay. So what is the gauge orbit? Okay, you just draw some arbitrary curve. Okay, you want this to intersect each orbit once. So a curve like this will do it. Okay. And suppose this curve is like y equal to f of x. So you have to do the same integral. Okay. But instead of integrating over this two-dimensional subspace, okay. we want to integrate over this one-dimensional subspace. Is that clear? So the ninth approach, okay, which will not be the correct one, as you will see, the ninth approach will be to simply insert delta of y minus f of x in n and d. Because if you insert a delta function, it restricts y to the f of x. Right, and so you restrict the integral over this orbit. So if you do that, then you get n over d as integral dx dy, or let me write dx equal to the minus lambda x squared I just inserted this delta function, okay, to restrict the integration over the gauge orbit. What not over the gauge orbit? What the? This is, this is what is called the gauge slice. Okay, that you pick. So these are the gauge orbits. From each orbit, right? And that subspace is called gauge slice. That's what you want to integrate over. But this obviously is the wrong answer. This is the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but as well, we have to put some constant on f of x. Okay? But uh, generally, f of x will have this problem. Okay? Take this curve that I've drawn, right? That has some here. Yes. This is a 2D sweep of this curve, right? Like, there you are reducing your plane for two, right? Yes. So that's the idea that you don't want to integrate over the whole plane, right? Because if you try to integrate over the whole plane, then you will run into the difficulty that we uh, mentioned earlier, right? You want to integrate over a gauge orbit, right? And this curve has a point that it picks each point from each gauge orbit, it picks one point. Okay. So you want to eventually reduce the integral to something like this. So we will see how, how to get the measure, right? Someone will... That's why probably it is wrong. Yeah, that's why it is wrong. But the question is, that doesn't tell you how to introduce a measure. Yeah. Right? So that, that will be the main goal of this uh, thing, right? But ultimately, we want to get something like this. So that's the idea. Then you want to insert a delta function and see what we can achieve. Okay? So to see that this is a wrong answer, okay, and that will also explain why it is wrong, the origin of this problem. is that we can take the same the simple a simple case simple case which is f of x equal to zero okay which means you are not taking the gauge orbit along the x axis okay y equal to zero which you take as a gauge orbit so in this case n over d will be given by integral 0 to infinity dx. Now we just said y equal to 0, which will be minus lambda x square x square divided by integral 0 to infinity dx, which will be minus lambda x square. Okay, and this I think if you calculate, it's like 1 over 2 lambda, which is not the same as 1 over lambda. Okay, so this is what shows you zero. Well, you can include the negative, that will just cancel with the numerator and denominator, right? So it doesn't really matter. If you include the negative, then you are like counting each orbit twice, but that's okay. Right? It still cancels with the numerator and denominator. Okay. Now, this picture actually also shows you why it is wrong, right? Let's compare this with this. Right? What is the difference between this and this? Okay. X and R are integration variables, right? Here, there is an extra factor of R. Right? Here, there is no X. So what is the extra factor? That is basically the circumference of the circuit. Right? For a given x, right, the gauge orbit becomes longer and longer as you go to higher and higher x. Right? And that we have not taken into account. Right? The volume, the fact that the gauge orbit becomes larger as you go out, okay, that is what is missing. Okay? And that's what we see it says is a problem with the measure. However, if we just think of it this way, okay, then it looks like the situation is again hopeless because to, if we have to really cal calculate the volume of each line, each orbit, right, then you are back to the problem of original problem, right? You are integrating over the whole space, right? You are just dividing the integral into this integral and the problem of calculating the volume. Okay? So the key point that I'll try to discuss today okay, is that you can actually see what the volume is okay, by working just in the neighborhood of this line. Okay, and that will follow from various properties of the groups. Okay. That you don't really need to calculate the whole volume. Okay. But we can get an idea. Okay, we can actually, whatever you need to know about the volume, we can get by working just around the line. Okay, so the final integral that we'll have will be something that will only involve the line. Okay. We have to insert something else, okay, which actually takes into account the fact that there is this volume factor uh, sitting inside uh, in the integral. But that will be calculated just by working around the line. Yes. Is it like a state? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is not, this is all internal space, right? So there is no physical scaling over there. No, not physical. 
In this case, yes, it is scaling. Of course, it is scaling by x, right? But for a general gauge loop, it's a very complicated transformation. Right? So that's what you have to uh, figure out what that, how to express that volume, right? Just by working in the neighborhood of this line. So I'm setting delta of x equal to zero, right? So delta of y equal to zero. So y we are setting equal to zero. Right? This is perfectly well defined. These, these are not zero by zero, right? Okay. So this is the problem we want to address, and we will try to address this by starting with now a general situation. Try to consider an integral of the following form. Okay, keeping in mind that eventually you want to apply it to part integral. means the collection of all these variables. Okay, there is no really vector space structure here, okay, but I am just using the shorter notation with vector u just to denote the collection of all these variables u r u to up to u n. So why we are considering this? This is exactly what you get in path integral. Right? Once you start with the path integral and discretize it, this u i that you have to think of this as the variables on which you integrate in path integral. So number of UI in a path integral problem will be the number of fields multiplied by the number of land spots. Right? Because every field has those many uh, variables. Now we'll further assume that S of U and O of U are invariant. Ui going to f i of u theta. But theta is an m dimensional vector with m less than m. So in the example that we just considered, this two dimensional example, n was 2 because you have two integration variables, x and y, and m was 1 because there is only one uh, gauge transformation, one transformation, right? that's the rotation, rotational symmetry. Okay. But this is a general case. And again, in the physical situation that we are interested in, number of feeders is also infinite, okay. but on a finite lattice, it's given by the dimension of the gauge loop, which is the number of generators of the gauge loop, multiplied by the number of lattice points. Right? Because for every lattice point, you have a gauge transformation, right? which has uh, so many parameters. Right? Like for S u n, n square minus 1 parameter for every lattice point. So n square minus 1 times the total number of lattice points. Okay? So that's what m represents. Is this clear? It can be, but then you just remove all variables, right? 
if 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 m is equal to small n, right? Then that means the number of gauge transformations is equal to number of fields, which basically means that you can just make all the fields to be uh, uh, zero by gauge transformation, for example. Right? So there will be nothing to integrate over in that case. Right? So generically, for example, if you have a abelian gauge theory, right? Then there are four gauge fields and one gauge transformation parameter. Right? So it will be n, the small n will be four times the number of lattice points, and small m will be one times the number of lattice points. Right? So that's only one gauge transformation. So this is a generic situation. No, it doesn't have vector space structure. You don't have, assume that it has a vector, vector space structure. In general, the groups don't have vector space structure, right? It's only near the identity that it has some vector space structure, but otherwise no. Yeah, we are considering the whole group. Is this clear? Now, We'll assume that these transformations have group structure. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if we make the transformation by parameter theta one, okay, and then again by parameter theta two, okay, that is equivalent to transforming by some new parameter theta three, okay, which is obtained by composing theta one and theta two. Is that clear? Okay. So if okay, I'll use also the vector sign for f. Okay, so vector f again means. So vector f will stand for basically f1, f2, fn. Okay. So you have this property that f of f u theta two theta one is f of u. So for given theta one, theta two, there exists theta three that satisfies this. Okay, then because composition of two transformations will be another transformation in the same group. Okay. But the reverse is also true. Okay. Namely, if we are given theta two and theta three, okay. then there should exist a theta one. That's the existence of the inverse. Is that clear? Right. So in other words, if, if we know that if you have u of theta one times u of theta two, okay, given two group elements, this should be equal to u of theta three. Okay. But suppose you are given theta one and theta three. Okay, two group transformations. You know that there must exist a u of theta two. Right. What is that u of theta two? That u of theta two is uh, u of theta three, u of theta one inverse. Right. So this group property is what we are going to use, okay. and. The other aspect that I'll be using is that this group composition law okay, doesn't depend on u at all. Right? For example, if you are given theta one and theta two, okay. what theta three you have? If you are given theta one and theta two, what theta three you have? Shouldn't depend on what u we use for this case, right? because group composition. Is a property of the group, right? It doesn't depend on at which point, which field configuration is acting on. Is that point clear? Okay, this is obviously true for the gauge transformation that we uh, define, right? When you compose two gauge transformations, it's another gauge transformation. And what is the parameter of the gauge transformation it doesn't depend on what field configuration you have, right? It's the same parameter irrespective of what field configuration you have. Okay, so there are these properties are the ones which are going to be used. So based on these properties, what is our goal? Okay. Our goal will be to express n and d as n minus m dimensional integer.
sentence through. So, but we told that was for only G1 to G1 means, right, in non-Indian case. Otherwise, uh, the guest termination also depends on the field continuity. No, no. Because guest termination, you can delineate cell on a plus B, H cell on a B, C, H cell on a B. Yes, but the composition law okay. doesn't depend on field configuration. Take a general uh, transformation, right? So you don't even have to take the take in terms of S mu okay. minus I del mu u u inverse plus u S mu u inverse, right? This was the transformation. Okay. So now suppose you transform by u1 first, then followed by u2. Okay, you first apply u1, then follow by u2. This is the equivalent to transformation by u1 u2 or u2 u1. It will be u1 first and then follow by u2. Okay. This has no knowledge about what s mu you are using. Okay. Right? See, this is this was one of the exercises. It's not obvious from here that that's what happens. Right? But you can check that if you apply first u1, okay. take the new s mu prime that you have gotten. Okay. Then transform again by U2. Okay. That is equivalent to transforming the original S mu by this U2 U1. Okay, I think it is one of the exercises, which is one of the homework problems. Okay, so this is something you can check explicitly. Okay. But this is what one means by group properties that when you compose two uh, transformations, okay, the composition doesn't depend on what the field configuration is. Okay, it's just the property of the group. Is this okay? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The point is for G mu nu, of course, things are simple. See, anything that transforms covariantly, right? There it's simple because you apply U1 first, then after you apply U2, right? For gauge field, it's a little subtle because of this extra term that is sitting here, right? That you have to make sure that all the derivatives appropriately combine to so that you can write the whole thing as del mu of u1 u2 times u1 u2 inverse, right? That's what you have to check. Okay, but it is true that on all fields, the group property holds. Okay, that you have to, have to apply the first element first and the second element, okay? then it's given by the product of the two elements. Okay. And that composition law has nothing to do with the field configuration. Right? For any S, it doesn't depend on S mu. Question. <coughs> so we'll assume this is just a convention that theta equal to zero is identity. Which means that f of u zero is u itself. Okay, you don't transform u. Uh, okay, identity means that you acting on act on u and get back u. So infinitesimal. Theta small will correspond to infinitesimal transformation. Okay, these are just conventions. Finally, We'll make one more assumption, which is that the integration measure is gauge invariant. Namely, that if vi is equal to fi of q theta, then product over i t ui is the same as product over i t ui. Can be limited by constant 
No, we don't want any constant Jacobian. It's just invariant. Right? Because it also involves infinitesimal uh, transformations. Right? So there's no uh, scope of having a constant. Okay, it should really be unchanged under gauge transformations. To the point, if, unless I mean this is needed for for well known two, and this is true in the cases that we know of. Okay, that when you make a change of variables, then you should get um, group invariant variables. Yeah, that is still true because dx dy, right? But you, it's not that way. R, you don't have to change variables, right? You have to think of x prime y prime in terms of x y, right? Let's look at x prime y prime in terms of x y. In the two D case, we had x prime y prime as cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta x y. Okay. So you have to calculate the determinant of this. The Jacobian, when you change variable from x y to x prime y prime, is just a determinant of this. Right? And that is one. So this change of variables is like changing from x y to x prime y prime. Right? Because b is a transformed version of b. Under the gauge transformation. Theta is generating the gauge transformation, right? In the in the 2D case, theta was generating the gauge transformation. Okay. So uh, so this statement okay, is reflected in this 2D case by saying that this Jacobian, this this matrix has determinant one. So this is connected to identity, that's why I know Jacobian will be there. I mean, Typically how do you uh, define a gauge uh, theory, right? Yeah, you define the integration measure which is invariant under gauge transformation. Sir, when the gauge theory are changing under gauge transformation, non linearly. Hmm. So, then will that, then also the determinant will be 1. Yes, even then the determinant will be 1, that you can check. Okay, in that, it's a little uh, complicated to check, but you can check that the, uh, even though the gauge fields are changing non linearly, See, the gauge fields are not really changing non-linearly. There is a uh, constant piece, which is here, right, which doesn't affect the determinant at all. Right? And then there is this piece, u s mu a u inverse. Right? This you can check, doesn't change the determinant. Okay, because this is, is yeah, these are things. Yeah, this is like R A B. You are multiplying M U A by R A B, right? So if you think in terms of the components, right? M U prime A or the B mu prime A is going to R A B times B mu A, B mu B, plus a constant, right? That constant doesn't affect the measure, right? And the determinant R A B has determinant 1. Okay, so that's one way to see that uh, it is true in ordinary case. Okay, so is this okay? Okay, so here is the goal, okay, that we, with all these assumptions, we want to now try to reduce this, okay, both the numerator and denominator, to n minus m dimension integral. Okay, because that's the expected dimension of the gauge orbit. Right? We had n dimension integral to begin with, we have m gauge invariances. Right? So by using those m gauge invariances, we should be able to fix m conditions right, and reduce it to an n minus m dimension integral. Okay? And once we reduce it to n minus m dimension integral, one expects that now we will not have the problems that we had earlier. Because you have already fixed all the gauges, right? There's no gauge symmetry left anymore, right? Because you have already chosen a gauge, uh, gauge slice. So let me be a little more specific okay. and let's say that what we want to do is to insert, we want to insert, insert the factor 
of product A is equal to 1 to M delta of A T of U minus A inside A and A. Where these are some functions. These are just constants. Okay. We could in fact absorb this into the definition of the function. Okay. I have not done it just for some um, um, you know, use that we have later. Okay. But for um, the purpose of this lecture, you can just think of this whole thing as a function. Okay. So you fix m functions, okay, h of u minus b a, okay. and those m functions we want to set to zero. We want to force the yeah. Uh, 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 yes. path integral or the integral to run over a subspace okay. defined by zero values of this function. Okay. So that's that's the meaning of inserting this delta function. Okay. Yes. So the point that the property that it should have is that HA under a gauge transformation <laughs> should change. Right? No, not in a, it, it shouldn't just be invariant. Because then what will happen is that the function that along the gauge orbit, so the point is A. So H is equal to B A defines an orbit, right? Okay. So when we apply a gauge transformation, right? You shouldn't be on this. See, this is a gauge slice. Sorry, this, I did not orbit, this is a slice. Okay. H is equal to B A. If you are at any point on that slice, right? And if you apply gauge transformation. What property do we do you want? That we should move away from the slice, right? So that's the property that we need. Okay, and we'll write it formally in terms of some determinant. But physically, this is what we need. That this should be transverse. This is what we mean by saying this should be transverse to the gauge slice. That when you make a gauge transformation, it should change. We'll give you exactly. So then the delta function. So that's the meaning of delta function restricting to this slice. And this slice is transverse to the gauge orbit. Is this clear? Okay, I'll go on. Okay. But we have seen that if we just take this and insert in this, we are of course not going to get the correct answer. Right? Because that was seen in this example. Okay. That's what we did in that example. Just took some delta y minus f of x and insert it into the integral. And you saw that you do not get the correct answer there. So we simply cannot just insert this. Okay, We have to make sure that whatever you are inserting doesn't change this ratio. So the way we will do this is to use an identity which says that if we do this integral One way to prove this is to change variables. You see, there are 
m variable ci m variable ci okay so suppose you define say sigma a and h a of f u Then this integral product d theta a times the determinant, this is del sigma a del theta b, right? Okay. So this becomes product d sigma a. So then this integral becomes integral product a equal to 1 to m d sigma a times product a equal to 1 to m delta. This is as this assumes, of course, that the gauge orbit intersects the gauge slice only once. <coughs> okay, because you shouldn't have more than I mean, this change of variable should be one to one, right? From theta, theta to uh, sigma. Is this clear? Yeah. That. So this says what? That you pick contribution whenever H A this argument vanishes, right? But this shouldn't happen for a given theta a. It shouldn't happen more than once. Okay, so that's that's the meaning of this being this uh, change of variable from sigma a to theta a should be one to one, right? Because otherwise, when you write this, okay, let me give an example. So when you say dx, suppose you are having minus infinity to infinity, dx delta of x minus a. x square minus a square times 2x. Okay? So what is the value of this? You now change variable to so, so y, which is x square. I mean, this is the change of variable that we are doing here, right? If you change variables to y equal to x square, x square, then you will conclude that this is like integral 0 to infinity dy delta of y minus x square dy. Right? But actually, the value of this, what is the value of this? This integral. Two. Well, it's actually zero. If you take two x, x goes to minus x. Right? It's an um, odd, right? So what? So what is missing? Right? Why are you getting one here? The reason that you are going to getting one here is because this x square plus x square equal to zero has two solutions. Right? One is x equal to a, other one is x equal to minus a. Both correspond to y equal to a square. So when you change variable to y, right, you are missing the fact that there are two uh, points, right, which you are counting by sign. Okay. So that's the meaning of this change of variable should be one to one, right? The x to y will change of variable that you are making, or theta to b a that change of variable that you are making, theta to h a that change of variable that you are making. This should be one to one. Okay, so let's assume that this is one to one and proceed. Okay, so that requires h a to be chosen appropriately. Okay, if the H's are chosen in the wrong way, right, then uh, uh, this may not be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the point is, uh, that's the point, that if we, if we just work near the x square equal to s square, right, then you don't care about what the limits are, okay? It's just that you look at it, right, delta of y minus s square, that's what we are doing here, right? So if you keep keeping track of the limits, basically means that you are keeping track of what, what the map is doing, right? That whole range. So it, what it does is it take, maps this whole range, not to infinity to infinity, but twice the zero to infinity range, right? As x goes from minus infinity to infinity, y goes from zero to infinity twice, right? 
and the, those two contributions basically cancel each other. Okay, sometimes it may add also. Okay, it's uh, uh, it's not always it should cancel, but the general lesson is that I mean this change of variable is meaningful only if it's one to one uh, transformation. Okay, so that's some property that H has to satisfy. Okay, this is equivalent to saying that the gauge orbit and the gauge slice will intersect only once. Okay, not more than once. So this so that this delta function that we are using shouldn't cut the gauge orbit more than once. Exactly. So that problem we have to uh, resolve, right? And those problems, but in perturbation theory, those problems don't happen. Right? So that's the reason why you can not worry about it too much when you're doing perturbation theory. So they may, they may intersect multiple times, but we will never see that they will be perturbation. In perturbation theory, exactly. How is the determinant coming? Oh, because you have to change variables from theta to sigma. Right? See, what did I do here? I had product d theta i, right? But product d theta i is not the same as product d sigma i. Yeah, this is the Jacobian. This is del sigma i del theta i, right? The sigma is, by, is I have told him to be h a. B a is constant. Right? So this object. Is a is a Jacobian, okay, which is making this uh, given case, right? Without this determinant, you will not get one on the right hand side. Right? Is this clear? Okay. Okay. So now, what we are going to do is that. Given that this is an identity, this one then I can insert in the numerator and denominator. I am just multiplying numerator and denominator by one. Okay, that is always allowed. Okay, so let's just do the numerator. Okay, denominator will be obtained simply by sending more to be one. Okay, so we just focus on the numerator for now. So the numerator is now given by integral product i equal to 1 to n dy and then this whole thing. So now we are going to change variables. Okay, to simplify things a bit. So I now change variable from u to v. So I define vi is equal to f i of u theta. Okay, I make this change at fixed theta. Okay, it doesn't matter because now you have the multiple integrals, right? So I'm thinking of that now I'll do the u integral first and then the theta integral. Okay, instead of the other way. So I make this change of variables 
Okay. And I use the fact that S of U is S of T and O of U is O of T and that product over I T U I is product over I T T I. Yes. Uh, is that use computational proof integral making sense? Yes. We are doing such. As long as it's finite dimensional integral, you can always do it, right? See, for finite dimensional integrals, but integral is, you, you, is finite, then there is no issue of changing uh, range of uh, integration variable, changing the order of integration. Also, the limit is uh, minus infinity. Exactly. Infinity. All the limits are from minus infinity. Uh, infinity. These limits are from over the group uh, volume, right? So you can always. Make this change of integration. So uh, that can you repeat this? We are uh, writing one equals to this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, all I have in, in, in that is I have inserted this one, which is this the big thing, right? And now I just do this integral. Both these integrals at one go. Okay. With this integrand, so it's a big integral now. Okay, but of course, our dimension hasn't really increased because even though it looks like n plus m integrals, there are m delta functions, right? So you still have n integrals, okay? Because it's the original expression. Okay. But now, what we are going to do is that we will do this integral first, then this one. Okay. So for fixed theta, we are not changing variables from u to v. Okay, where v i is given by this. Okay. But this is of course this is a gauge transform. So v i is just a gauge transform of u by theta. And this function f i, we assume that has all these properties. Okay? This is the invariance, gauge, gauge invariance of the measure, this is the gauge invariance of the action, and this is the gauge invariance of the operator that I have inserted. So with this, I can then write integral product over a equal to 1 to m d theta a product over i equal to 1 to m d t i. For i s of t, o of t, and then product a equal to 1 to m delta a q of t minus v x, and then this determinant. And the determinant, of course, I have to still keep u. So I don't want to write H A B because this derivative has to be taken at fixed u. Right? This, otherwise, if you write HAV, then there's no theta dependence uh, here, right? So here, after taking the derivative, we have to side and substitute for u in terms of u. Is this clear? So this is the part that you want to analyze carefully, right? Because this is where u is still hanging around, right? So the idea now is that we want to, if we can write this as some function of v, okay, times some function of theta, then you are done. Because then what we will do is that this is some function of v, so that's a v integral, okay. times some function of theta, that theta integral will be separate, okay. and now the theta integral has completely factored out. So far, it's not like that, right? This one depends both on u and theta, which means it depends both on v and theta, right? In a complicated way, there's no factorization. So you want to show now 
that this one actually has a factorization. Okay, that it can actually be thought of as some function of v times some function of theta. Okay, once that is done, then that function of theta can be taken out. Is this clear? Okay, so this is what you want to show, and for this you have to analyze this carefully. Okay, so we could probably do it in one step, but let me just do it in uh, two steps. Okay, that we, what we will do now is that we let, let's write this by using chain rule. So del H A H A F of U theta del theta. Let's try in one step. If it gets too complicated, we'll break it up. Okay. Multiply by delta theta n. Both sides. Pardon? Five theta. Thank you. So this is given by H A of F. U theta plus delta theta minus H F U theta. <coughs> well, this is a change in this under a change from theta to theta plus delta theta. Okay, so this is clear. Is this okay? okay? So now we use the group property. Okay. So now we claim that this quantity can be written as H A F Okay, what does this mean? Do you remember this identity that we had written? F of F theta 1 theta 2 is F of theta 3. Remember this that given theta 1 and theta 2, there exists a theta 3. Okay. Or given theta 1 and theta 3. There exists a theta one, theta two. Okay? Oh, sorry. Given theta three and theta one, there exists a theta two. Okay? All of these are equivalent, right? By followed by group property. So here our theta three is given. That data theta plus delta theta. This is our theta three. This is the final thing that you want. Theta one we choose to be theta. So then there must be some group element which composed with this one will generate this. Is that clear? And I have written this, this as delta w theta because it should be small. Right? When the limit when delta theta goes to zero, this is, should be zero. Right? Because then this is just an identity transformation. Right? In other words, if theta 1 and theta 3 are equal, then theta 2 better be zero. 
So using that, I have written as a delta w theta. Okay. Keeping in mind that it's small, okay, but it's not the same as delta theta. Nobody tells you this is the same as delta theta. Okay, there is some small quantity. Okay. This becomes smaller as delta theta becomes smaller. Is this point clear? This, in fact, is the key point that will allow us to do this factorization. Okay, otherwise, you will not be able to do this. And so, the group property is being used here. Is it okay? Then I'll proceed. Okay, so this is the. This so this quantity I can now write H of now you see the delta theta has been taken out, so I write this now as B. I should have written minus H A of F in theta. This is still there. So this is H A of B delta theta, delta W theta minus H A of B. So this I'll write as del H A B phi del phi B at phi equal to zero minus. I think we didn't make that in F. I forgot that. So this is F of B, right? And H of F of B. Okay. Oh, this is B, yes. So something is wrong. <coughs> Yeah, it has single argument. So H A has, has B. First term should be corrected and now it is correct. Um, is this okay? Yeah, I think this is okay, right? of f of b delta w theta okay, minus h of b. Okay. So this I'm going to write the first one. Is, the first term is h of f of b 0. I'm going to tell actually the next term. Okay, in delta W theta. Okay, this whole thing I'm thinking of. Delta is expanding around delta W theta. Okay, so the first term is H of F of B of 0. That is the same as B. This is the same as B. Plus, del H A of F of B phi del phi B. Phi equal to zero times delta W theta B 
マイナス1はThis one now I'll write as del H F B phi del phi B phi equal to zero. Delta W theta B, okay, something small. One theta is delta theta is small, okay, and Is determined purely by the group property, right? Because let's recall the definition of delta W theta B. That if of if U theta delta W theta was f of U theta plus delta theta, right? F of U Okay, this was the defining relation for delta W theta. Okay. And as I have said, this is this means that if you take the transformation by delta W theta okay. and compose this with the transformation by theta, you will get the transformation by theta plus delta theta. Okay. So this composition rule should be independent of what u we have chosen. Right? Because this is this comp composition rules should follow from the property of the group. Okay. It may be complicated. You don't know what it is. Right? For any given group, of course, you can find out what this composition rule is. Okay. But mm -hmm. we don't know what this composition rule is. Okay. But what we know for sure is that the relationship between delta theta and delta W theta cannot depend on it. Right? So we write down the most general relation that is possible, <coughs> namely that. Delta W theta B. Here it was delta W theta B. We replace this by S A B of theta times delta theta. S A C of theta delta theta. S B C. For some matrix S B C, which can depend on theta, but it doesn't depend on it. Is this clear? See, delta theta is small, right? Delta W theta is also small, okay? And as delta theta becomes smaller, delta W theta becomes smaller. <laughs> so the relationship between delta W theta and delta theta must be a linear relation, right? Plus corrections over delta theta square, which you don't care. So that most general linear relation between delta W theta and delta theta is this. And S B C can only depend on theta, right? It cannot depend on u, right? So theta is the only other thing that is. And give it to us. So it depends on theta. Is this clear? Yes, that is 
Theta is not small. Theta can be very large. Right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So you want delta theta. Yes, yeah, so I want delta theta. So the point is what I am using the fact that delta w theta is small when delta theta is small. Yeah. Right? No assumption about theta. Right? Because delta w theta came by composing theta plus delta theta with the inverse transformation by theta. Yeah. Okay? That we know is to be close to identity. Right? But what it is, right, is not determined easily unless you know the group property, right? You have to look at the, uh, the actual group transformation laws, right? And in general, that composition of what the composition of theta plus delta theta, transformation of theta plus delta theta, with transformation of theta inverse, okay? what that gives as a function of delta theta, right? Can depend on theta, of course, right? And that's what we have written here. Is this clear? Again, as I said, for any given group, you can actually calculate what this is, right? But since we don't, have not committed to any particular group, right, we just keep it as x, okay, some function of theta. So now we are more or less done. So we compare this side with this side. And what we learn is that del a k f of u theta del theta b is I'm going to change b and c in this. Okay, so let me write change it to c, c, c and c. Mm -hmm. Last one is c. Delta. This is sorry. What did I do? Del last delta. Delta w theta c. Let's see delta. Okay. So this gives you that this is del a k of f b e phi del phi b del phi c. Phi equal to zero times S C B of theta. This was the crucial point for separation. Okay. Yeah, so this is this are the crucial point. This is the group property that yes. the relationship between delta w theta c and delta theta b, right? Shouldn't depend on u. Right? It should only depend on the property of the group and hence on theta. Okay? Because this, how it is composed, could be found independently of what it's acting on. Okay? That's the point okay, which was necessary to get, get there. So once you fix theta and delta theta, delta w theta is fixed. But what it is in terms of delta theta depends on the group. Right? See, theta, if, if you fix the, so what is the relation between theta, delta theta, and uh, uh, delta w theta? That if you take the group transformation by theta plus delta theta, and multiply by the inverse of the group transformation by theta, you get group transformation by delta w theta. Right? So once you give theta, theta plus delta theta, you have no choice about delta w theta. It's fixed by a group, group uh, 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 property, right? But how exactly delta w theta depends on the delta theta will depend on what group you have. Yeah, and it will in general also depend on theta. Right? And that's what is encoded in this matrix S that we have here. So this is still not factorized. This is a function of V, this is a function of theta. Okay. But you still have this contraction. But once you take a determinant, you see these, these are both square matrices, right? All the indices runs over this ABC index, right? Which runs from one to M. So this is a square matrix, this is a square matrix, right? And as you know, determinant of the product of matrices is the product of the determinant, okay? So using this, I can now replace this determinant with the product of this determinant and this determinant. 
Here then you have full separation between the theta integral and the Murphy integral. This is purely a property of the group. Right? See, it, of course, it's, I mean, it, it, it's something that proper is part of the group information, right? And the group acts on the trans, uh, on H to go to take it to a transfer direction. So abstractly, it has that information, right? But the point is, if, if, if this can be calculated independently of what. Uh, uh, any gauge theory, right? So once a group is given, this can be calculated. Right. Okay, it doesn't depend on what gauge slice you have chosen or what, uh, what theory you are considering. Right? It only depends on the particular group that you are using. Okay, so now we have a nice formula for n. So n is given by integral product over a g theta a determinant of s of theta and then integral product of one i equal to one to n d d i The denominator is the same thing, same expression without one. So to take the n over d, right, this just cancels. Okay, this in fact is the natural integration measure over the group, right, which is often called the hard measure. Okay, because this is really the property of the group. Okay, and you can show that this is the hot, this is a natural integration measure over the group, but we don't need to care about this. This just cancels with the new merge and denominator. And what we are left with is this dividing by same thing without O. Okay, so let me write that expression here. Over D. I cannot change the integration variables from D to U, right? So just relabel, just rename the integration variables from D to U, okay? Just to, to make it look like the original integral. So you have integral product i equal to 1 to n D U i to the i s of U. O of u, oh, I forgot the delta function. Then we had the got lost. That nice, what's a missed writing in some direction? Okay, this of course is very much there. So delta this determinant del h a of f u phi del phi at phi equal to zero and then divided by U minus 
Pardon? So it's the n, but these delta functions make this into n minus m dimensional integral. Right? Because I mean, so the goal was to make it into n minus n m dimensional integral. It, it is that because of this delta function. So m delta function sitting over here. Is this clear? So you see, this is more or less what you wanted to achieve, right? The new ingredient that has come in by doing this manipulation is the determinant, right? If you forget about determinant, it's exactly what you are attempting to do earlier, right? Just insert delta function to fix gauge condition. But you see that these determinants are necessary to make sure that the original integral is the same as this integral. Now before I finish, what I want to do is to just check that this, with this, now we can repair the problem that we had having for this two-dimensional integral. Remember that for two-dimensional integral you had fixed gauge and you had this problem, right? So now let's see if these determinants can resolve that problem. So there we had n over d integral dx, okay, after gauge fixing, okay, I use this y equal to 0 gauge, integral dx, which will be minus lambda x square, x square, divided by integral dx, which will be minus lambda x square. This was giving the wrong answer, but now the only thing that has Then you have this two determinant factors. Okay? So let's calculate these determinant factors. Now here in fact the determinant factor is easy because there's only one gauge fixing condition, right? So the only one gauge parameter, A runs over only one value, right? That was the theta, the theta integral. So only one gauge transformation parameter, so only one gauge condition. So what was our gauge condition? So you said y equal to 0, right? So ha is y and bi is 0, right? So ha is y and bi is 0. So ha of xy is y and bi is 0. Now what is the determinant? So you are first supposed to calculate HA of transform of X and Y by phi. That's the meaning of F U phi, right? Okay. So we have, we have to calculate HA, HA not of XY, but XY transformed by phi, right? So what is that object? What is X transformed by phi? That is x cos phi plus y sin phi and then minus x sin phi plus y cos phi, right? Okay? But h a of y is y, x y is y. So this is just minus x sin phi plus y cos phi. Where h of x, y is y, right? So if you take this argument, you just pick the second argument. So you are supposed to calculate del del phi, del h a 
of x cos phi plus y sin phi minus x sin phi plus y cos phi del phi and then you are supposed to evaluate this as phi equal to 0. So when you take the derivative with respect to phi, okay, this is minus x cos phi plus y sin phi at phi equal to 0. Sorry, minus y. This is at minus x. Okay. In fact, this minus sign is a bit of a, uh, I mean, uh, non-existent because actually, instead of having determinant, we had a more of a determinant, okay, which we didn't uh, write. But it doesn't matter. That will cancel between numerator and numerator. Okay, so this overall sign this really doesn't make any difference. So now this determinant is, we just replace this by minus x replaces by minus x. Right? And now this is the original ratio, right? So written in terms of r, right? Because r dr e to the minus lambda in r square r square, right? That r was missing, okay? That is being supplied by this determinant. Okay? So this procedure, you see that indeed gives us back, okay, the correct ratio, which we are missing by doing this right replacement, now you insert of a delta function inside the integral. In principle, that can be a function of x, y, both? Yes, in principle, of course, that can be a function of x, y, both, but the, the delta function, delta function, yes. the delta function of y, delta of y, right? So that will eventually set y equal to 0. So next time, basically, we will use this and translate to gauge theory. Okay. This is a finite dimension integral, but of course, the path integral is uh, regarded as a finite dimension integral, right? So whatever you have learned here, you basically translate to the corresponding gauge theory. Okay. So the only annoying feature here, right? If you look at this, okay, in fact, there are two annoying features. One is that you are now integrating for constant variables, right? There is a delta function sitting here, okay, which is not something that you have originally, uh, I mean, when you uh, calculate, for example, our propagators, etc. Right? We didn't have constraints of this kind. Okay? If the constraints are simple, right, setting some fields to zero, that you can easily implement. Right? You just set those fields to zero in the uh, uh, action. Right? But a more general constraint will be difficult to uh, uh, substitute. So that's one annoying feature. The second annoying feature is determinant. Right? This determinant, I'm nor normally the way we have we uh, developed our perturbation theory at exponential of something times a product of operators. Right? Not something which has like determinant uh, sitting here. Okay. So next time we will see how to deal with this determinant. Okay, and also how to deal with this delta function. Okay. We'll continue next week.